join with us in membership covenants uh, today. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, I preached a message called Life Builders, uh, and it was to be a two-part message, but I don't even remember what happened that next week. I didn't preach it. I think it was the week that our grandkids were born. I'm not quite sure, but anyway, so we're back to that part two uh, this, this morning. So uh, it's the part two of the Life Builders message, but if it had a subtitle, it would be called this, Waterproof. Can you say that with me across the room? Waterproof. Waterproof. Uh, and if you, whether you know it or not, you are in the construction business. Whether you realize it or understand it, you are a construction worker. You are the builder of your life. You do control what you build and where you build, but you will never control the elements that what you build has to stand against. You know what you're building, you know where you're building, you know how you're in control of how you're building. You can control all of those things, but you will never be able to control the elements that fight and come against your life. There is one guarantee, and that is winds will show up. There is a guarantee, and that is that the rains will beat upon your life. There is a guarantee, and that is that the storms will last longer than you ever thought they might last. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, the wise builds on the rock and the elements will not affect it. And he goes on to say, but the foolish build on the sand and then when the elements, the rain and wind come, uh, that house will be destroyed. And if you remember a few weeks ago, I brought Mr. Ken Edwards up and, and asked him some questions about building. And I tried to convince him to build a building for me, but on my specifications on the foundations. And wisely, he denied what I wanted him to do because I'm not a builder, even though I have my own opinions and I thought it was a pretty good idea what I wanted, but apparently it was proven not to be the right way. Uh, so thankfully, he said a big no, capital N-O, uh, to my idea. But if you remember during the conversation, and it wasn't, it wasn't scripted or, or planned in this way at all, uh, in the middle of our conversation, he said something that he didn't even know he was building into the next part of the message. And he said, whenever you're building the foundations in the process, one of the things you have to do is you have to put visqueen or plastic down as a moisture barrier and as a water barrier. So as I was studying this out more, I called Ken this week and I asked him the reason. Why is it that you need to put that visqueen, that plastic down? And he said, because if you don't, water is able to seep in and literally it will get to where it can soak boxes. It can come through the floor and the foundations and it can get, uh, it can get your carpet wet, all sorts of different things. If there's metal, it can rust it and eventually it can destroy the home if you don't waterproof in the right way. So you have to have this barrier to keep out these elements, to keep out this water from the foundations of the home. And guess what? In the Bible times, they didn't have visqueen. Did you know that? In the Bible time, they didn't have plastic yet. But they did have a specific process that is very interesting when it comes to waterproofing things. And in fact, it's one that God designed and it's one that God gave and that they continue to use to provide protection from rain and waters and keeping things from sinking uh, and water from slowly seeping in and destroying. And we're going to look at three examples of waterproofing in the Bible and we're going to see how that applies to our life today. Uh, in the construction job that every one of us are, are in, which is the building of our life and the what, the where, and the how that we are building. 
So this first example is going to be this. Number one, by faith, Noah rightly waterproofed the ark both inside and out. By faith, Noah waterproofed the ark on the inside and out. How do we know this? Genesis chapter six and verse number 14, uh, it said, make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and get this, coat it with pitch inside and out. So when you learn what pitch is and you study it, that is a tar type of material. Uh, it's a material that God instructed Noah to take. And as he's building the ark, take this tar and pitch it, just paint essentially tar on the outside of the boat and on the inside so you can have a waterproof type of place. And this point that God, this instruction that God had given Moses was critical because Moses was about to fight and come against the storm of his life. He was about to come against the rains of, the, in fact, the rains that the, the largest that the world would ever see, he was about to, to come in contact with. So Noah, not only doing what God had told him to do about putting the pitch and tar on the inside and out uh, was keeping the water out of, out of the boat and keeping it from sinking physically, but he was also preparing his own heart and life uh, to keep himself uh, from sinking to the bottom of the storm that was about to come his way. So see, with every nail that was being driven, with every board that was being cut and every animal loaded, Noah was spiritually brushing another coat of pitch and tar on his life so that he would be able to withstand the things that were going to attack him and his family, the things that God knew. And here's the deal. Noah was building and waterproofing on one thing, and it wasn't with pitch and tar. Essentially, what Noah was really waterproofing his life with uh, was faith in the God that he knew. That's really what it came down to. He was following the instructions of the God he knew, but it was all about faith because they had never seen the rains before. It was all about faith in the God that he knew uh, that was bringing him to this place of trust uh, to be able to come against and survive the storm of his life. And friends, we need to understand when we apply faith in God and in his word, both on the outside things of our life and on the inside things of our life, then we are creating layers in the spirit that keep the storm from affecting and sinking the life that we're building through Christ Jesus. As they say, everybody will come in these scenarios where the, where the fan will hit the ceiling. Everybody's going to have issues of life at some point in time. And unless you are sealed in the ark of Jesus from the inside out, then I can promise you the storm will be too much. But for those who know Jesus and have stepped into the ark of God and allowed the Holy Spirit to seal us in, then it doesn't matter what comes our way. We will, through Jesus, rise above the storms rather than end up being being below them and it only happens through Jesus Christ being our Lord I can tell you the waters will seep in and they will destroy your life in every fashion if you do not let Jesus be the ark of your heart and life it is all about Jesus you see, God has not designed you to be the, at the bottom of the storms. He's designed you to get in the ark of Jesus, be sealed by the Spirit, and it doesn't matter how high the waters come, he keeps you on top of what is going on. Well, the waters might get rough, there might be waves, but doesn't, it, you're just gonna keep rising, keep going, and keep moving up whenever you are following the things and the plans of God. You see, what... Uh, what this ark looked like to everyone around Noah was a big joke. What this ark looked like to everyone around Noah was a big joke and it looked like it, was, it would never succeed and he was just wasting his time. 
but God used it to bring Noah to safety in his family. And the world will tell you coming to church, serving Jesus and all that is just some big joke and you don't need it. But let me tell you something, it is God's plan to bring you to a place of safety and to seal you to where the issues of life will not seep in and destroy you and rust you and cause you to be damaged. But instead, we, the Lord will rise you to the top of whatever you are faced with. The brush, brush strokes of faith applied to the inside and outside of your life is what every single one of us must have if we're going to succeed and be who God has designed us to be. So what do these brush strokes look like? Just very quickly, we just have just a few examples that I'll give you and we'll move on to another point of waterproofing. Uh, we're gonna start with the, with the inside, the inside brush strokes of the pitch and tar of the things that we do. Uh, one, you have to get in the ark and you do that by accepting Jesus. We've talked about that. That starts with the inside. You have got to get in the ark by accepting Jesus. That's the brush strokes, uh, the beginning of the sealing of your life on the inside. Thankfully, we've seen what, eight or so, maybe even more people come to Jesus that we know of over the past two weeks. Somebody give Jesus a hand for that, amen? I think it was seven over here and Pastor David led one to Jesus the next Wednesday in the, in the youth service. Thank you, Lord. We're excited about that. Getting in the ark of Jesus, accepting him. Another brush stroke on the inside that seals you up is every prayer that you pray is brushing on another layer of waterproof tar, waterproof tit pitch in the spirit that seals you in. How about this? Every Bible verse you read and quote, you're applying another stroke in your spirit that's going to keep the Lord and keep you from sinking with the issues of life. Very quickly, because we have a lot to cover, we'll go on to the outside types of applications. It, remember on the ark, it was the inside and the outside that he put the pitch and tar in. So on the outside, the outward applications that we have, very simple things. One, did you realize every time you pull up into the parking lot of church, you're painting another layer of waterproof pitch on the outside of your life? Every time you pull up to come into worship, you're saying to everyone around you, I'm putting my faith in the God that I know and I'm sealing myself into the things that he is doing. And it is an outward type of water sealing of your life. Another way is each fruit of the spirit that comes through you, you're going to find another layer of sealant God putting on the outside of your life, the long suffering, the patience, all of these things that are coming on the outside, protecting you from the fights that you might get in without them. Thank you, Jesus. What's another one? The obvious for today, these new members that we have, that we have uh, invited and accepted into the family of God here. It's like they have applied another layer that waterproofs their life that much more into the things that God is doing on the outside. You made a statement today that you're as closely uh, as possible following and connecting yourself to the things of God, waterproofing this process in your life so that you can rise above the storms. Friend, there's too many sunken boats in the world. There's too many sunken lives in the world. There's too many shipwrecks that's gone on. And I'm preaching to you today how we seal ourselves and we come above and we stay on top of the issues of life. So faith in God is the beginning of the waterproofing of our life. The next thing that we need to understand in this is that the methods of God won't work without faith in God. The methods of God will not work without faith in God. What does that mean? We're going to go to Genesis chapter 11. Uh, and this is whenever they were about to try to build the Tower of Babel. And here's something interesting. It says, that they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and they used tar for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So notice in verse three that they used, a, instead of using mortar, they begin using this tar. This, this tar was the pitch type of material that, that was used earlier in Genesis whenever they were sealing uh, the ark and Noah was sealing it. So you ask yourself the question, why would they want to waterproof the Tower of Babel? Babel? Why would they feel like it was important to try and seal it from water? 
Well, as you read and learn the story, you find that in disobedience to God's word, they were trying to self-protect with God's methods. You see, because you learn, if you go to Genesis 9, you find out right after the flood that God spoke to Noah's family and said, you're supposed to tell everyone to go and scatter across the whole earth, and you're supposed to populate the earth. And now in disobedience, you're finding them in Genesis 11, they, they have settled in a plain, in a concentrated place, and they said, we're going we're gonna to build ourselves a tower, and we're going to all stay right here. And this was in direct disobedience to what God had called them to do. Well, they understood that God didn't like disobedience. Now, even though God had promised he would never flood the earth again, they didn't have faith in this God. You see, understand, these are people who would have still been able to find the bones and remains of those who have been killed in the flood. These are people who would have still discovered the remnants of the flood that had happened, but yet somewhere along the line, they had disconnected themselves from the faith in the God in which that delivered them, and in direct disobedience, they decided to go with their own plan but let's just throw some of God's methods in just in case he decides to bring in another flood so they attempted their own version of trying to protect themselves using God's method just without faith in the living God so what's the difference why wouldn't it work why couldn't the Tower of Babel have, have really worked for them? If God had allowed it to really be built, uh, how come it really wouldn't have been a place of safety for them? Because here's the deal. God's ark was never attached to things of the earth. And because God's ark was never attached to things of the earth, when the storm's waters came and the, and the winds came, it kept rising above and above and above. But the Tower of Babel, the methods of man, could only be connected to what the earth was. So if the waters would have ever come it wouldn't have mattered the fact that it might have been waterproof to some certain extent because eventually the waters would have risen above it and it could have never it could have never survived uh, the storms that would come and here's the deal it doesn't matter what you are doing in your life in terms of the methods of God if you are tying the methods of God into the faith in the living God then your then your efforts are going to be in vain this isn't just a live a better life book. This isn't just a, just follow the methods and everything's going to be uh, just, just, you know, whatever you need it to be in life. No, but this is a living book about putting faith in the living God. And when you start with faith in the living God, then the methods, baby, will play out. But it's got to be faith in who God is. And some of you are trying to attach everything to the earth with the methods of God coming along. And you got to detach yourself from the things of the world and put your hope and faith in the fact that we have a soon coming king. And baby, we're going to be out of here someday. The blessed hope of the church, the dead in Christ will rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the air. And there's no attachment to earth when that time comes. Hallelujah. So I'm not interested in methods of a better life now. I'm interested in faith in Jesus Christ that's going to get us up out of this place someday. That is the waterproofing that we need in our life. All I can say to you is detach from the things of the earth and get into having faith in the living God. Get in the ark of Jesus. Get in the ark of Jesus. Let the spirit of God seal you in because Jesus will bring you above the waves and the water, not keep you under them. Some of you here today feel like you're drowning. There's so many things going on in life and it's as if you're just drowning. And God hasn't designed you to drown in the issues of life. But he's given of just Jesus and he's opened the door to the ark through Jesus and he seals us in with the Holy Spirit and he'll help us rise above if we're just willing to let go and put full faith in who Jesus is this is all about faith not just methods 
It's all about a walk of faith with Jesus, not just doing the things the book says. It's faith in God. Let Jesus bring you above the storms. Let him bring you above the issues of life. So it begins with faith in a living God waterproofing, sealing your life up to where it is, it is able to withstand, is, is brushing the tar, the sealant, the waterproof process on the inside and out with faith in the God that we know. And then it's understanding the lessons that's learned from the Tower of Babel that, that you can't just waterproof something and attach it to earth and expect it to do the things that God does in his ways, right? It's, it's about faith in God. And lastly, uh, this last example that we have is really about the family. And I just sense that the enemy is after families in a tremendous way. And I want you to hear this last point very specifically this morning concerning family and realize there's a moment in everyone's family when you will hope you already know how to waterproof because you're not going to have time to learn on the fly. You're not going to have time to learn on the fly. The scripture tells us in Exodus, we're going to read the last chapter in verse, in, in, or the last verse in chapter number one and then read the first three in, in Exodus chapter two. Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile, but let every girl live. So Paul's there. Imagine every Hebrew mother that's having a child, a boy child, a man, will find a soldier knocking on the door and throwing that baby into the Nile to be drowned and eaten. Imagine that, right? Now, verse chapter number two, verse one. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a, a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. So she waterproofed this basket, right? Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. So here Moses' mother, this is the story of Moses. Moses' mother, the Levite woman, saw something unique and special about Moses' life, about this child that she had. And if anybody can see something special in a child, it's going to be mama, right? Where's all our mamas out there? Amen? It's going to be mama. And because of this, she knew she needed to take action. She refused to just stand by and let them destroy this child, this gift that was given to her. So when the time comes, we've already learned, uh, or, or, or when, when the time came for her, she had enough faith and belief that, that she was going to be able to do whatever it took to protect her son from this awful decree that had come out. She knew she had to take action. And here's the deal. If you've already learned about God and learned of his, his faithfulness, then when these times come in your life, you can confidently in a moment put your family in the hand of God and trust him. So get what she did. It's absolutely mind-blowing. She takes this three-month-old child. She builds this basket. She puts tar on, the, on it to seal it so it will float. She waterproofed it for him. And then she goes to the Nile, puts him in the reeds of the Nile. And then what does she do? She walks away. She walks away. Do not confuse this. We'll talk about it in a second. Do not confuse with this with the idea that she abandoned Moses because she never abandoned Moses one time. She simply walked away with enough faith to put him in the hands of the mercies of God. She did everything she could do and she places him and says, God, if he stays, he dies. If I put him in your hands, I believe he has a chance to live. So 
at the first of the story, I, you know, when I, when I was really reading this, I, I can't say that I dove into it as much as I have over the past several weeks, but, but I've always kind of thought, you know, that, that, that Moses' mom was, was probably just tore up and distraught and, and all of this and just, you know how mamas are. You can't pry their, their kids away from them. I mean, look at, look at Ryan. He's dad and he's holding baby Kai right now, right? But I guarantee you, Angie knows right where baby Kai is. You can't get these babies out very far from their mom. Uh, that's just the way that, that life is and it's beautiful, right? So at first I always read this and thought, man, this just must have been a tearing of the heart moment and, and things. But the more I think and pray about it, the more I think I'm probably wrong. And I think it's most likely, I think it's more likely that Moses' mother had such confidence in the God that she served and in his plan that she was able to walk away rejoicing, saying, God, I'm not worried about where Moses is going to be because he's beautiful. I see something in him. There's giftings. There's anointings. I've done everything I can do. I waterproof the basket. I've sealed it up. I've placed him where I know he needs to be and God is in your hands and now I just rejoice in what you are going to do in his life. But I can tell you something. She didn't learn how to do that when the knock came on the door to come and get Moses. She wasn't learning on the fly. She had already built this this life of faith as a Levite woman. She had already built this life of faith to know what to do when the knock came at the door to steal the gift of her family. For me, I would have been like the older sister of Moses that went watching trying to find out what's going to happen. Gator going to get him or what's going to go on, right? I remember when we first, we were evangelists for years and we, uh, we, we were uh, on the evangelistic field and we homeschooled our kids uh, and we go to Missouri in 2011 and began pastoral ministry and uh, so we put our kids in public school and I felt like the first time we dropped our kids off, Cole in particular, he was like first or second grade, we drop him off and we felt like he was walking right into the middle of the Nile. And Pastor Reese and I are sitting there bawling our eyes out like the dude's in second grade and we feel like we're throwing him to the wolves, right? Because he had only been in school with us. So we're the ones like peeking through the fence, trying to look through the windows of the school. How's he doing? What's he doing? Calling, right? It's kind of like the, the sister in the story. But Moses' mother refused to let the enemy have what God had blessed her with and she gave him his best chance because she understood the process of what to do and how to protect him and give him his best shot in the middle of the Nile. And church, when it comes to our family and what we see in them, the anointings and the gifts that God has given them and placed inside of them, then we must have the ability and the faith in God to just place them in his hands too but we're not going to find that kind of faith in an overnight moment we've got to be waterproofing we've got to be learning we've got to be building this life of faith we've got to be doing what we need to do the methods of God but first founded on the faith in the God that we know so that when the moments come when the enemy comes when you get the phone call from whoever it is when your kids are on, with marriage problems, when your grandkids are in NICU like ours are, whenever all these things are going on and you, you name your own problems, you've got them too. And listen, friends, uh, it isn't that we, we don't want to sit there and learn how to do it right then. We need to already have known what to do and have already taken the precautions and the necessary things uh, to waterproof uh, our family against the attacks of the enemy because I refuse. Listen to what I'm telling you. I refuse. I refuse. I refuse to stand back and just hand over our family and our children to the plans of the enemy because I see something special in them and we're going to waterproof and we're going to teach and we're going to disciple and we're going to grow each other in the things of God so that when the enemy comes knocking, baby, there's no hope in the enemy's plan because God will sustain them and they will rise above the storms and his plans will be fulfilled in the name of Jesus. 
Jesus. That is the faith we must have. That is the faith we must attain. Faith in the living God to sustain and do and be whatever our family needs. And to be able to say, God, here they are. It's out of my control. The problems are bigger than me. They're this and that. I do everything I can do. And in faith in you, I put my family in your hands. Because God's plan are bigger than our abilities. Listen, understand the enemy is going to come after your seed. He's going to come after your lineage. He's going to come after your dreams. He's going to come after your potential. He's going to come after your gifts. He's going to come after your promises. He's going to come after your marriages. He's going to come after all of it. He's going to come after all of it. I've lived long enough to know he's going to come after it. We're, going to, we're victorious, then he's going to come after it again. We're victorious, and he's going to come after it again. So we keep waterproofing. We keep building what we know to build with the help of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to feel like you're drowning today. But this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit will help you rise above the things that's taking place. So here's, here's how the Holy Spirit just put on my heart to do this. I'm going to ask us to stand across the building, please. I'm going to ask you to respond as a family today. You see, this is part of that outward, that outward putting the pitch on. It's that outward sealing. It's, it's the response. It's saying, I'm going to publicly take action. And every step, it's like we're just putting, putting more sealant on the outside of our life and on the inside of our life as we come to a place of prayer. But dads, moms, families, I'm gonna ask you if at all possible to respond, okay? And if you don't have any family here, there's gonna be a moment for you to respond as well in just a second with your church family because you may be here without what your natural family, but you've got blood family here through Jesus Christ. So I'm gonna ask you if, if, if you're with your family today, and you want the help of the Lord in waterproofing your life from the issues, and you want to be able to rise above the storms that will come and will beat, I'm gonna ask you to take your family by the hand, wherever they are, if they're in different places of the room, go get them, that's fine, and come stand as a family unit around the altar. Would you do that now, please? Husbands, wives, kids. Thank you. We need to tighten, tighten in, tighten in. Make room for everyone, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Every family needs this time together. Every family needs time at the altar together. Please come quickly. Wherever your family's at, just go to them, please. I believe the Lord is going to do some special things in people's hearts and lives, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe God wants to do some things today. So for just a moment, just how we are right now, I'm going to ask you just to begin to just begin to pray with your family. You don't need me leading you. Just begin to pray with your family. Pray over your family right now. This is the building of your life of faith. This is the waterproofing of your your family against the issues of life, against the things of the enemy. Give me your attention just a second. Jesus. Hallelujah. How many heads of household do we have here? Just raise your hand like this. If you're head of household, just raise your hand, right? Head of household, just raise your hand. Keep your hand up. You keep your hand up, okay? Well, no, put it down for just a second. What I'm about to ask you to do, you may have never done before, okay? But it, the Holy Spirit just spoke it to my heart. It's not been planned, but it's, it's important. To, it's biblical. And I believe it's going to bring breakthrough because, friends, listen, the enemy's after homes. 
I know I've said it, but I just sense it. Uh, there's things going on. Satan is after homes. Uh, Satan doesn't want you to succeed. The enemy does not want you to survive. Uh, he thinks he's got you attached to the things of the world. Uh, he thinks he's got you attached to the earth to the point uh, that you just aren't going to be able to get yourself free. But in the name of Jesus, freedom is coming uh, through Christ. Uh, and I'm telling you, I've said it over and over today. You are about to rise to the occasion. all the bottles of oil we have, wherever they are, please. If you're a head of household, raise your hand up. We're going to pass a bottle of oil around, okay? If you're a head of household and you're going to take this and you're going to put a little bit of oil on your finger and you're going to anoint your household, you're going to anoint your family, every one of your family members that's here, you're going to anoint them and then we're going to pray together, okay? We're going to believe the Lord together. In the name of Jesus, go just just pass it through. We're going to start from here. Just pass it around. Every so keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if you're a head of household. Keep your hand up, Jerry. Just pass. Just let them pass it through. Just let them. bottle going everybody with your hand up okay once your hand is, is once you have oil you put your hand down don't pass the folks in the front so so get everybody close to you there you go we need it right here too right here too we gotta do this quick if they got their hand up give them oil quick we need more bottles of oil Believe it, give God a hand. 
it. If you believe it, I mean give him a shout of praise in this place. Give him a shout of victory in this house. Glory! Give him a shout of praise. Woo! Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm talking about marriages that have been restored. I'm talking about people who have come out of the pits of the issues of life that God has helped rise above. Woo! Now, y'all, I'm going to give you a second chance to praise God like what for the things he's really accomplished. Three, two, one, go ahead. Yes! I used to say this all the time. I'm going to say it, then we're going to stop. I want you to say it with me. You ready? Anytime we give the devil a black eye or make him, or you know what I'm saying, that old saying, I was, I know it's churchy. I was brought up in church, but this is what, this is what we used to say all the time. Ready? Take that devil. So we're going to say it together. One, two, three. Ready? You got to say it with some grit. I mean, like you just won the Super Bowl and you were the underdog, right? You got to say it with some grit. We're going to say, take that devil. Ready? One, two, three. Take Take that devil. (laughs) Woo! Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Woo! God is good, isn't he?